my question is to all the panels. Uh, any person who is super intelligent and greatly he helpful to the society cannot get elected unless he or she is super rich or supported by super rich people. This is the reality of politics today. I am afraid that, that this cannot be called democracy. What do members of the panel say about this? Allegra, you're rich. Um, is it make it easier to get into Parliament? <laughs> this was coming to me. Um, look, I think that, you know, the Australian Parliament needs to be a place where, which is represented by a broad range of people and in terms of gender, in terms of background and in terms of, um, where in, in terms of ethnicity and, and more broadly, what the great qualities of the Australian country. And I think that it is, it is, that's important to absolutely all of us. And I think then you, you look at the Parliament and say, look, how do we make sure that this is truly accessible to, to everybody who, who wants to participate. And I think I, I come back to actually some of the, you know, a bit of the questions that we raised at the start in terms of integrity, in terms of how can, what is the options for, for people to get involved in politics? And you can certainly get involved, you know, through the parties, but I think, you know, political donations are really an issue in this country and it's something that we should absolutely reform. And I absolutely invite the, the Liberal government, who's in, in power at the moment, to consider what donation reforms it could um, undertake to make sure that many people can can really participate in in that democracy. Well, you, you... That said, I'm going to can I I'd yeah. like to add something else? Is to say, you know, I don't you know I don't have a full socioeconomic background of everybody in in Parliament, but I don't believe that everybody in Parliament is from a super wealthy background, and I think it's really important Chris, to make sure that people are encouraged. Chris is sitting Chris next to you. I think Chris would. No rich or super rich. No. So I think that but... it's really important to to say that there there are open there are options open. So. I think it's, I've got a more positive um, view than, than perhaps um, than, than you shared there. Let me just come back on the question of donations in a minute. But, but it, is, it is an interesting question, Chris, because, you know, there's a time, days <laughs> gone by, when you'd have, you know, train drivers and shearers in Parliament, and it's become incredibly professionalised. People are either lawyers or doctors or business people or they've worked their way through the political system. To come from the working class or to have a trade and end up in Parliament is still quite rare, isn't it, now? There's also, there has been, Stan, a societal shift as well. Um, as for the, I, I, you don't have to be rich or super rich to be in Parliament. But to your point, Stan, you know, my dad was, was a shift worker at the NRMA. Mm. My mum was a childcare worker. We grew up at a fibro house in Smithfield, um, the suburb I still live in. Uh, and that's a, quite a common story uh, in federal parliament, in parliaments. Um, I'm the first in my family to go to university, and that would be a very common story, certainly on the Labor, Labor side, that... You know, we, we, we are the first generation of the sons of and daughters of tradespeople and shift workers who had the chance to go to university. And my parents were smart enough to go to university, but they wouldn't have dreamt of it. Uh, same with my grandparents, my great-grandparents, etc. Um, and so there's, that's that shift, which, we, again, we're proud of in the Labor Party because we think we played a role in that in the opening up of universities and the lifting of the school retention rates in the 80s and 90s up to 90%. It was 30% in 1983 of kids who finished Year 12. By the time I left office in 1996, it was 90%. And a lot of those kids went on to university. Now, you don't forget that. You know, I don't forget my dad coming home at 7 o'clock in the morning from shift work. I don't forget my mum looking after five, five kids, uh, you know, to get, you know, to, to support the family. You don't forget that. Yes, we managed to get to university. Um, and that's a wonderful thing. Um, and, but there is a role. But there, should be a, there should be a place for everyone in Parliament. And I, I guess we'll come to the, the question about well, donations that, well, and that, money that, and all that, that sort of that stuff. That is the question. And, and you may not have to be rich, but you need rich backing. It takes money to get there. And I want to go to the, what we've seen over, over the past week, Allegra, and we, mm. we've seen Zali Stegall and now in conceding of failing to disclose a $100,000 donation from the family trust of a wealthy business person who'd had coal investments, so mm. accused of hypocrisy in many respects there, mm. taking money from coal and also not disclosing it. Um, and the person who was blamed for this, her financial controller, Damien Hodgkinson, is apparently yours as well. Is that the case? So Damien Hodgkinson has been my accountant, yes. And I think, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm new to um, running campaign and so I'm trying to work with people who, who know how to make their declarations appropriately. And, and are I... you confident 
him given what we've seen this past week. Look, Zali Stegel it, says that I'm, he's the person to look, blame. I'm paying for an this. absolute great deal of attention to this because I think that is those questions are really important. But I actually think there's another option here, and I think that you see it with something someone like Kathy McGowan with how she built her political career because she wasn't rich and she wasn't really backed by really rich people, but she actually built got th got her community together and said what is important to you and she listened to that mm. and through that built and she actually built a grassroots movement that enabled the enabled her entire community to say look we want to change you know a very safe seat to achieve something where our community feels truly truly represented so i think that there are a couple of different ways to get there but one of them is actually mobilizing your community because some of the most impactful things that you can do in this election and and more broadly is get organized just with just with people you know some of the most effective parts of what we're doing is actually just saying, getting people together and saying, what's important to you? And put on a T-shirt and get out and about. So those are those are really important places um, to start and there are options there. Uh, are you just on Damien Hoskinson, he's going to remain as your financial controller, advisor? We are looking at all options in terms of how to make sure that everything is done absolutely effectively because this is a very serious issue. So perhaps he won't? I, I'm just making sure that I do the right, you know, I have the right... Uh, returns and everything from that point of view. So I, I want to make sure I'm going through this, everything with a really fine tooth comb, and if there are any concerns, then I, then he won't, or if he would like to move on uh, otherwise. Andrew. Oh, look, I think uh, politics without ideology in Australia is dead. Um, this election needs to be a positive experience for our community, and that means uh, ensuring that the community is front and centre in the campaign. We're all tired, we're all exhausted, we've all had enough of the pandemic. Uh, my community has been belted by a whole heap of things. Um, you know, we can humanise climate change and mm. the pressures there. Um, if you do not have the ideology there, you start to strip away the potential foundations of your liberal democracy. One thing I would say at the moment um, is that there is a real disconnect and people are disengaged with politics in Australia. They've had enough. The partisan nature of it, it's, it's making people tired. Um, my most successful time in state politics was when I was Disability Services Minister. The person I worked with most closely was Jenny Macklin on the NDIS. Mm. And that was possibly the biggest social reform the country's had in decades. And it was bipartisan. So I think it's really important um, that the parliaments do reflect Australia. Um, you know, ultimately at the moment, uh, there is a question around the independent movement, and obviously it's an issue for the Libs. Um, one thing I would say is that, you know, to be truly independent, um, ultimately, there does, does need to be that openness and transparency around who's, who, who's your backing. And if there's one backer across numerous independents, that's not an independent movement, that's, that's mm. a political movement.